Hello, this is Minister Leonard Harris, and we would like to say blessings in the name of peace to everyone, to all of our Pleasant Green parishioners, and to our listening audience. Uh, This is September the 4th. We are now into our fall series out of the Faith Pathway Study Manual. And this is lesson number one out of unit one entitled, God Calls Abraham's Family. God Calls Abraham's Family. And the subject title for our lesson for this Sunday is Unbroken Promises. Unbroken Promises. Our devotional reading is Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 8 through 19. Our background scriptures are the same as our printed text, uh, Genesis, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 7, and the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 7. Uh, our key verse is the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And that was the NIV version, Genesis the 12th chapter and the 7th verse. And our lesson's aims are trace the promises that God made to Abram slash Abraham and their fulfillment. Appreciate the frustration that comes with having to wait a long time for an expected good thing to happen. Develop strategies to wait patiently for God. And Our lesson has three parts to it, and the first part is entitled, Chosen and Called to Let Go, and that would be the 12th chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 3, and then the second part is Committing to the Call, 12th chapter of Genesis, verses 4, 5, and seven. And finally, reconfirming the commitment. And that's the 15th chapter of Genesis, verses one through seven. And our lesson uh, has uh, uh, some instruction and uh, some insights. Uh, and direction towards uh, being called, being committed, and being confirmed. And we would like uh, to indulge into the understanding of those references. And uh, we know that uh, this won't be possible unless we ask that the Spirit of God would lead, guide, and direct us uh, in this endeavor. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once and again for doing what you always have and always continue to do, and that is to provide for us, to look after us, protect us, uh, to provide and to guide us uh, by your Spirit. Uh, that we would be the vessels by which your work may be performed and manifested uh, by your Spirit through us and to bless others. So we ask that as we uh, try and read through and understand uh, the words which you have spoken, 
that it would compel and convict us by your spirit that we would go forth and be lights in a dark world and show others what your intent for mankind is. And we ask it all in the name of Christ, and for his sake we ask it. Amen. Unbroken Promises Um, As we think of ourselves as individuals and in uh, our humanity or our humanness, we make promises. uh, And uh, initially our intent is to fulfill the promise that we've made to someone else. But uh, circumstances and uh, unanticipated incidents and different issues occur in life, and we find that we are not always able to fulfill the promise that we've given to someone else. Sometimes these failures in completing or fulfilling the promises uh, damage our reputations, it causes delays, uh, sometimes uh, it brings misfortune to other people because of their dependence upon uh, the promise that we've made. And in our introduction, uh, there is a good food for thought with speaking to sometimes the broken, not the unbroken, but the broken promises uh, that we've rendered and possibly damaged some relationships and disappointed people uh, and therefore. And uh, so one of the things that were listed uh, in the introduction Uh, says, how then should Christians deal with their own broken promises? And here are four steps. Number one, admit the failure. Two, acknowledge its impact on others. Three, apologize for the consequences. And four, assist in resolving the issue. So as we begin to look into our lesson and the title, Unbroken Promises, uh, first of all, we should definitely uh, explain uh, or just proclaim uh, that we know that all the promises of God are yea and amen. The promises of God are yes and amen, simply meaning that God's promises are for certain, they're sure, and it is so. And when God speaks it, when God says it, uh, we know that as a uh, we have coined a statement, we can take that to the bank. We know that the promises of God are uh, beyond uh, failure and uh, beyond being broken. So now, in our first section of our lesson, it says, chosen and called to let go. And it tells us how that the Lord spoke to Abram and told him to go from his country, leave his country, leave his people, and leave his father's house. Uh, This, of course, was after his father had passed, and the Lord is now moving Abram into another direction, into a fulfillment of God's overall plan for the salvation of humankind. And it starts, uh, it, it uh, picks up here with the involvement of Abram 
in God's uh, fulfillment of the destiny of humankind. And so he tells Abram, first of all, I need to remove you from your common surroundings and your comfortable surroundings. Uh, I need to remove you from the relationships, uh, the people of your family, those that uh, you know, the, the uh, commonality in your area, the familiarity with your area. And I need to remove you from the overlay and the customs and traditions of your father's household. Uh, I need to establish with you a new relationship. And in order to do that, I need to change the environment that uh, you are familiar with so that I can introduce myself to you void of all of the distractions or all of the norms that you are used to so that you will understand and develop a dependency and a relationship with me and recognize where all of your blessings come from, not from following the governance of your father's household, not from the familiarity and the comfort levels you've established with the people in your immediate surrounding, and not from the customs and mores of the area that you've been brought up in. But I want to establish with you a new relationship, a new covenant, an agreement, and to bring to your understanding where all the things that will be fulfilled in your life, where they have come from. And so to do that, God said first, first I have to bring you out from among your familiarity. I have to bring you away from what you're accustomed to. And that is the process of letting go. But then look at what it says directly after uh, it explains that I need you first to let go of the things that you are accustomed to. Then it says in verse 2, once you do this and go into the land that I will show you, then it says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all people of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, these are the promises and the confirmations that God is making with Abram, saying to Abram, if you follow my instructions and do as I have directed you, that then you will become a great nation. I will bless you. Now, let's look at the age at which this is taking place. Abram is 75 years old. 75 years old and in an area that is southeast of present-day Iraq. Uh, he's in the Ur of Chaldee, which is just at the entrance to the Persian Gulf. And he's being asked to leave the Ur of Chaldee and he's going to move over to the land of Canaan, which is present day Israel. And 
Uh, this is a distance just a little bit short of 3,500 miles. Uh, uh, the, some of the scales have uh, read that this is 3,461 miles. That's the distance of travel from the Ur of Chaldee over into Canaan. And now, uh, at the time, Abram is 75 years old. And so, just imagine, uh, let, let's take a look. Uh, at ourselves and uh, just uh, uh, try and uh, put this in perspective. Uh, we've been living in a place uh, for seven decades, a little over seven decades, and we've, we've grown quite familiar with our surroundings. And now uh, God is asking Abram to leave that which he has grown uh, to adopt to, and uh, he has uh, developed a family, uh, he has relations uh, with uh, the people in his surroundings, and now he's being asked to leave all of that behind and go into a land that he's not familiar with, a land that is already occupied. And so uh, some of us, not all, but some of us, uh, we get disturbed and stressed out, uh, even if we're on our way uh, to work, and uh, a road blockage occurs. Uh, there's a detour. And now we have to try and navigate through other w roadways in order to get to our destination. And just the frustration of not being able to go along a familiar route, one that we've traveled for years and grown quite accustomed to. And now because there is road work going on, a construction, and now there's a detour and I have to deviate away from a travel route of familiarity, I become frustrated because now uh, where am I supposed to, what turn do I make and where is that street at? I've never heard that name before. And, and so just a change in our daily routine. But God is asking Abram to leave all of that which you are so well accustomed with behind. And I'm going to take you into a new area. And this requires quite a commitment and quite a dependency upon the one who has given the mandate. And that is what we begin uh, to see unfold into the second part of our lesson uh, entitled Committing to the Call. Committing to the Call. And I'll read from the NIV. Uh, this uh, will be starting at the fourth verse the fourth, fifth, skips the sixth, and goes to the seventh. And it tells us here that, So Abram did as he was instructed. And as the Lord had told him, he took his nephew, his brother's uh, son, he took his nephew with him, Lot. And it says again, Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. And he took his wife, Sarah, with him, his nephew, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. And upon their arrival, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him.
to him. Now, now it's interesting that uh, during this transition in Abram's life, that when he comes uh, to this new dwelling, that one of the first things that he does, it tells us that he built an altar there. And this was in the land mass of Shechem. And there he builds an altar to have a place of solace, a place of peace where he could commune with the God who has been instructing him. And when we read through the 12th chapter, we find that the building of the altar took place before he set up his tent, before he began to set the boundaries and the area from which his household and those possessions that he had gained and his uh, people that were with him, before he began to set up camp, he establishes an altar first. And what, what does this uh, say to us as we uh, believers today uh, are sometimes uh, brought with the challenge uh, and new experience of uh, transition, going from a place of familiarity to the unknown. And where is our focus? What do we do when we arrive in new surroundings unfamiliar to us? Uh, do we first try to establish a relationship with uh, someone that we think uh, is in charge? Uh, do we try to uh, establish relationships uh, with those that uh, are new acquaintances? Um, or, or do we try and link ourselves to established orders and rulership? Or do we seek out a place of solace, a place of peace, a place where we can withdraw to commune with the one who has directed us in this new dwelling. And I think this is a key point to focus upon to where Abram's uh, priorities are. What does Abram consider to be uh, first things first. So in our uh, second part, committing to the call, uh, it, it tells us about uh, Abram's uh, focus. Uh, and I keep saying Abram because uh, Abram's name did not change to Abraham until the 17th chapter, which is not uh, in our lesson today, but it's in the 17th chapter when the Lord tells Abraham that your name shall no longer be called Abram, but Abraham. And then in the 17th chapter, God reveals and reaffirms to Abraham again about how he is going to bless Abraham, that he would be a blessing to others, and that he would be the father of many nations. Now, in our second part, um, it uh, gives us a reference to uh, the uh, first book of John. Uh, and it uh, focuses in on John, 1 John 2, 15. And I thought that would be a good reference for us to read because it, uh, it, it kind of focuses sometimes on 
uh, certainly we are not in the time uh, span or era of Abraham. Uh, but here, uh, in reference to uh, the transition for Abraham, it, it explains to us this, and this is First John 2 and 15. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him or her. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. I thought that was a key point uh, to lift, uh, committing to the call, because a lot of times our blessings are distracted by the lust of the world, by the things of the world, by the trends of the world, by those tangible materialistic things that the eyes see. And sometimes it becomes confusing as to uh, how we distinguish blessings of God and acquisitions of man. The blessings of God and the acquisitions of man. And one of the things in our lesson that is a key point is God's purpose in blessing Abraham. He first tells Abraham that I am going to bless you, but then he says, so that you will be a blessing to others. And so one of the things we can distinguish between the separating between the blessings of God and the acquisitions of man is that we notice a lot of people acquire a lot of things and it begins to develop, uh, it develops an appetite for never being satisfied, for always wanting more and more and more. And in the process of that, sometimes we step over others that we could be a blessing to in order for us to continue on the path of acquisition. Whereas on the other hand, the blessings of God compels us to be of assistance and an aid and to try and give to others so that we recognize, as uh, we all often saying, that what he has done for me or what he's done for others, he can also do for you. And so we recognize this uh, by our giving of what God has given to us. And then we deposit that blessing to others. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, when we, well, I'm going to go to this because this ties right it back into it. Uh, as believers and uh, as Christians, um, I also would like to uh, distinguish this about being influenced by the lust of the world. In the intercessory prayer offered by Christ in the 17th chapter of John, uh, and this is starting at the 13th verse, uh, John, the 17th chapter, and the 13th verse. And it reads, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. Not joy in the world, 
but the fulfillment of joy in themselves, in ourselves. We often say, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. It reads on and it says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. What is the truth? Your word is truth. Sanctify them, separate them by your word, and your word is the truth. So we wanted to just uh, address that it was uh, highlighted in the, um, it was highlighted in the lesson in our second part. And as we uh, come to the close, uh, I just wanted to uh, lift this here as well. In uh, our commitment to fulfilling uh, what God has done in our lives and, and being blessed and being called uh, to be blessed, uh, that does not always mean that we don't have uh, uh, disappointments. Uh, we don't always have, uh, that means that we're free from strife. That means that uh, we don't uh, encounter any misfortunes in life. Uh, no, 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 it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, but what it does mean is that when we do encounter misfortunes, uh, when we do or when we are faced with challenges, uh, that there is a God that is present with us. Now, in your leisure, uh, it would be uh, uh, an advantage, it would be a benefit to us uh, to also read uh, chapter 13 and chapter 14 in between uh, 12 and 15th chapter, uh, because it tells us of some of the misfortunes that... Uh, Abram, Abraham ran into, uh, tells us how a famine broke out in the land of Canaan. And although he was not instructed by God in his humanness, Abram fled to Egypt. And when he fled to Egypt, he was fearful that the Egyptians were going to be taken, which they were, by the beauty of his wife, Sarah. And and so he concocted a story to tell to the people that this was his sister because he feared that uh, if he said it was his wife, that they were uh, going to take advances and they would probably kill him so that they could have his wife. And what happened was, again, when we think about it now, he said, I will bless them that bless you. And curse them that curse you. And a misfortune fell upon the Pharaoh of Egypt because he was doing, he was making advances towards Abram's wife, unknowing that Abram's wife was, uh, was not Abram's sister, but it was his wife. And once he recognized this, then he told Abram, take your wife and leave so that these circumstances I am now facing and consequences because you told me a lie. I will be free from that. So take your wealth and leave. So uh, Abram uh, goes back to the land of Canaan and then one of the other things that takes place, again, when we're talking about 
us as individuals, just because God has favored you, because God's hand is upon you, God is blessing you. Now, Abram was blessed beyond reason. Him and his nephew Lot had so much wealth. When we read into the uh, 14th uh, chapter, um, I'm sorry, into the 13th chapter, uh, you'll find that Abram and Lot had so much wealth. They had been blessed so abundantly by God until they had to look at all that God had given them and then develop a area where because their wealth was so abundant, it began to create conflict between their hired help. Those that were looking after their flocks uh, began to argue about whose pastures uh, the flocks were feeding from. And the workers began to uh, have disagreements with each other. And Abram and Lot had to make a decision to say, uh, we need to spread out the abundance of God has blessed us so much. It's causing problems. Now, isn't that a nice problem to have? But then they decide that, okay, we need to expand our boundaries. You look and whatever it is, Abram speaking to his nephew Lot, you look and whatever it is that you see that you want, I will go opposite of that. And if you look at the opposite of that, that I uh, choose. If you choose that that's what you want, I will choose the opposite of that. I will give you first choice. Whatever you say, whatever you see, whatever you desire, I will take the other. So uh, he ran into complications because of the blessing of God. And so uh, another thing that uh, we should look at, and this comes up out of the uh, 14th chapter. Uh, here, uh, Lot is taken. Lot goes to the land of Sodom. And there, there were wars and there was civil unrest and there was one ruler against another. And Abram learns that his nephew Lot had been taken. And so he gathers the 318 trained servants, trained military men. And he goes into Sodom. God blesses him. He conquers and retrieves Lot. And as a result of this, it establishes a practice that we still honor today. And it establishes that Abram is overwhelmed by the blessings of God and he establishes to give a tenth of his wealth back unto God that it may be used to bless others. And the high priest, uh, Melchizedek, um, the high priest, he honors um, uh, Abram's uh, gift given to the high priest to bless others. And this is a continuance that we still have in our offerings unto God, just giving God back a portion of what God has given to us. And so we learn from this. Now, as our lesson reaffirms in the end, uh, and this is the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 7. And here uh, we learn of the manifestation of two of the accolades uh, that are given uh, to God. God uh, just explaining the uh, character and the manifestation of God. And the one is El Elyon. And the other is El Shaddai, and that is God the Most High, and then the All-Sufficient, Almighty God. And God is speaking to Abram again in a vision, and he tells him, Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, 
your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate, Eleazar, Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have not given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Earth Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. God many times finds us uh, occupied by the issue of the day. And then God has to reaffirm to us. He lets Abram remember. I remember where I took you from. The Irv Chaldee. I took you from the dwelling of your father's household. And I brought you from there into a new land. But look at the process along the way. How I have afforded unto you blessing behind blessing behind blessing. I was with you in the famine. I was with you in the uh, in the collaboration between you and your brother. How to divide the wealth that I have abundantly given to you and your your nephew Lot. And I was with you also while you were in battle trying to retrieve your family member. So he affirms what he has said unto Abram by a, a reminding Abram, look from where I have brought you from. Therefore, don't doubt what I am telling you now. Because if I have done all of that, this is just the beginning of the fulfillment of my promise to you. And as we close, we would just like to say, just look where God has brought us from and just think about where he's taking us to. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.